Medical service company developed a one-of-a-kind CPAP monitoring program called Compliance 2020. Compliance 2020 is an industry-leading and innovative approach for supporting patients throughout their, their journey to improve sleep. What makes Compliance 2020 unique is that the program coaches a patient through three distinct treatment outcome pathways, an adherence pathway, a clinical pathway, and a therapy rescue pathway. Compliance 2020 engages and connects with patients on their terms using voice, email, text, and self-help communication options. We've learned that as a patient begins CPAP therapy, it is essential to communicate early and often. Through Compliance 2020, patients receive no less than six outreach notifications or encounters within the first 30 days of therapy. To learn more about MSC's Compliance 2020 program, visit medicalserviceco.com slash sleep therapy. I hope you are enjoying this day of healthcare education. This brings us to our final speaker for today in the sleep track. Dr. Kingman Stroll will be presenting on treating OSA and the mechanisms of current therapy. Dr. Stroll is a world-renowned sleep physician and speaker with a true passion for what he does. He is a professor of medicine and physiology and biophysics at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Dr. Stroll is also the director at the Center for Sleep Disorders Research at the Lewis Stokes VA Medical Center and the director of the Case Fellowship in Sleep Medicine. Dr. Stroll practices clinical sleep and pulmonary medicine with specific expertise in respiratory control, mechanics, pathophysiology of gas exchange, and clinical drug and device trial design. Dr. Stroll collaborates with clinically and basic scientists locally, nationally, and internationally in researching high altitude and aerospace, physiology, narcolepsy, neurophysiology of breathing, and clinical surveys. As you listen to the upcoming lecture, feel free to submit your questions to Dr. Stroll under the Engage tab. Finally, to receive credit for attending, please complete and submit the evaluation after the session concludes. Good afternoon, I'm Kingman Stroll, and we're going to talk for a little bit about treating OSA, mechanisms of current therapy. I have some disclosures. Uh, I work in this field. I've been a consultant to Inspire Medical that makes the uh, Inspire device. I've had NIH and VA awards on causes and consequences of apnea. I'm a current uh, consultant to Symmetrics, which makes CNEP, which is in uh, FDA pre-approval for the trial status. And I also have been a consultant for something called Seven Dreamers, which makes a device called Nascent that I'll talk about. Uh, these are not FDA approved, but the that and the drug therapy I'm going to talk about will be discussed in terms of its physiology and mechanistic uh, implications. And I hope you can appreciate that uh, how we're going to treat sleep apnea in the future needs to have a, a basis of what the proximate causes of this disorder is, are. The lecture objectives are to compare risk factors to physiologic causes for recurrent sleep apnea, to recount the importance of the anatomy and OSA treatment, and to list other targets. So the sleep apnea types you know pretty well. You're in the field. They're called central or non-obstructive, obstructive, and mixed apneas. Airflow is absent. Ribcage abdominal motion is absent in central or non-obstructive apneas. That is, no breathing is going on. Whereas in obstructive apneas and mixed apneas, there are these wiggles in ribcage abdominal motion, which represent efforts. The oxygen saturation will fall during these particular events to a variable degree. And there are various subtypes, flow-limited breaths, hypopneas, respiratory effort-related arousals, hypoxemia, and things that uh, 
we kind of note now after we've had several years of experience. I'm going to first show a videotape of obstructive sleep apnea. This is a 29-year-old with excessive daytime sleepiness, heavy snorts and snoring, restless sleep, heavy with a BMI of 41, history of bipolar disorder and hypertension at a fairly early age. And I have the objectives of this are for you to listen and watch and tell me what you sort of think or is going on. Now, you can do that, of course, silently because this is on tape, but I want you to think about what this is. So if I started here, you'll hear background noise. He's looking like he's trying to take a breath. And now he's breathing. One. One breath. Only takes one breath and goes right into the next apnea. Now, while it looks like he's trying to breathe, he's making efforts against a closed airway. His mouth is kind of working hard, but there is no airflow. And these efforts get larger until he breaks it with a resuscitative snore. One, two. And then obstructed breath, he actually stops breathing here for a minute or for a few seconds and then starts up again. And this particular cycle of obstructive apneas, rescue breaths and snorts, and re-entering into another apnea is the hallmark of obstructive sleep apnea and sleep apnea syndrome. So when you take a history and think about this person, you get an idea of pretest probability for sleep apnea, but it's not causal. So the stop bang, which is snored, tired, observed apneas, pressure, BMI for body weight, age, neck, and gender, this, this stop bang really has anatomy, symptoms, consequences, demographics, age, male or female. And then we make an examination and ask other questions about head form, mal and potty, look in the back of the throat, family history, and bed partner. These are not causal features. These are just risk factors. And all of these things are present during wakefulness as much as they're present during sleep. So the problem with a sleep apnea is that you first have to have sleep. So as you're asleep, you go into an obstructive apnea. And in the arrow here is you're coming out of an obstructive apnea. And you have one, two, three, four, five breaths like we almost had before. We have then an apnea which goes on for about, uh, oh, maybe 20, 24, 25 seconds in which there are esophageal pressure measurements that P10 centimeters of water during the entire uh, effort. There's an arousal at the end of this apnea. But you notice that there is uh, increasing efforts like we saw before, before you break from that apnea. But as you enter into the apnea, there is a decreasing amount of efforts as indicated by the esophageal pressure measurement. So these particular elements need to be explained in terms of their causality. What actually makes this obstructive sleep apnea? Well, the first feature is you have to close the airway.
And the initiation of obstruction has a value called P crit, critical closing pressure. There are other features, but we can measure this in the sleep lab. The negative P crit keeps the airway open. A positive P crit causes it to close. And so how do you measure this? Well, you have a person asleep and you're varying the pressure at a CPAP mask. And as you do that on the left, the pressure goes from about plus eight down to uh, plus two. The flow on the vertical axis goes down until there's a point in which the airway is closed. So the airway is open at eight and closed at two. Now the examples you have over here on the right are how you do this. You either can dial up the pressure from one to three to five to eight, or you can go down. It doesn't matter. But this determination of, of P crit really determines what is uh, in the field called the anatomy of the system. So you first have to be asleep, and then you have to have a small collapsible airway to have a, a obstructive apnea. And then there are other features though. That's not the, 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 the P crit, the collapse of the apnea is not as important as how many apneas do you have? You gotta have multiple apneas. So there's another feature in here called gain or the sensitivity of the control system. So as you break out of your apnea, you need to go into another apnea. Now, anatomy is important in everyone. So a P crit that's somewhere between minus five and minus two or so is a vulnerable airway and could go either way. But as your P crit gets higher, that is the pressure that closes the airway that you have to overcome with CPAP gets higher, you always have uh, OSA. And a value of about zero or atmospheric pressure, you'll always have OSA. But on the on the, uh, the horizontal axis is the numbers of apneas, the severity of these apneas. And the severity of these apneas goes from zero to 120. So you can see that a person could have a P crit of say plus three and could have a, a, a 15 AHI or could have 100 AHI. So something has to amplify those particular events. So one of the things that you, you have seen with sleep apnea patients is you give them CPAP and you uncover central apneas or non-obstructive apneas. In this instance, there's one, two central apneas in which there's no airflow, no rib cage abdominal motion, yet they're on a CPAP of about three. So as soon as you kind of open that airway, you uncover this gain feature. And this gain feature is one of the reasons, another one of the reasons for why you have multiple apneas. So we now have two things, anatomy, gain, and of course, sleep. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what are these targets for these causal pathways. You can treat this, this pathway on P crit is on the, on the bottom axis, on the horizontal axis, and loop gain is on the vertical axis. 
So P crit, we know that there's that vulnerable area there, and it's unstable to the right of that line and stable to the left of that line. And within that box are those critical pressures, those pr critical closing pressures in which you can go either way. And what you can see is that, that you could treat sleep apnea by a couple different ways. You could take this P-crit and try to drive it down into making the airway higher, harder to close. And CPAP does that. Or the other thing you could do is you could make this stability index, this gain index, go down and make the airway uh, uh, more stable because it doesn't have these large swings in respiratory drive. Now, though we're going to apply these concepts to our current therapy, and we're going to think about how we would treat sleep apnea. And first of all, I don't really care how we treat sleep apnea now or in the future, but it all has to be related to maintaining upper airway patency during sleep, restoring sleep continuity so you don't have these arousals, retaining adequate gas exchange, improving the quality of life, sleepiness, neurocognitive function, lower diurnal pressure, decrease all-cause mortality. This has always been the goal. And as that, if those goals are achieved by whatever therapy you have, say treatment with positional therapy for mild sleep apnea or um, more dramatic means, it has to, has to meet all those principles. So we want to talk about what is it, how, where does this therapy work? And we're going to go through a variety of things fairly quickly. So the most common therapeutic pathways to recurrent OSA treat anatomy. Tracheostomy. Nineteen sixty four, Kulo and Dahl described a tracheostomy. You bypass the upper airway. The residual central apneas that occur resolve over time. Sleepiness resolves. Hypertension improves. Hypercapnia, core pulmonality and cardiac arrhythmias resolve. But with a tracheostomy, there are psychosocial problems, local granulation tissue, and recurrent bronchiolitis. So you know that the problem is in the upper airway, and you can always treat it with a tracheostomy. I've not done one for years. But we have to realize that there is a treatment when people say, well, there is no other treatment. There is a treatment with a tracheostomy. Now, people have worked on this topic a little bit, and most recently, this NASTET, of which uh, I talk to people in Japan about it, and it's in Europe. It's a little single-use tube that you put in through your, nar nar your nose, one side of your nose, and you keep it in there at night. And it props open the upper airway. You breathe through it. And uh, you breathe well. It bypasses the site of obstruction just as much as a tracheostomy might. Now, I don't tolerate it very well, but some people do, and they think of it as a preferable option to other forms of therapy. The most common one that we use is CPAP. 
It's an airway splint. It doesn't bypass the airway. It's first described to Colin Sullivan, doesn't care. It just dilates the airway as a pressure splint against a positive P crit. It also increases functional residual capacity, that is lung volume itself, and lung volume, because since it's tethered to the upper airway, uh, makes it stiffer as well. So it's a mechanical device placed on the nose or the nose and mouth, creates a positive pressure, and uh, then fights against that closing pressure. The example that comes from the work of Colin Sullivan, 1981, shows on the top a baseline at night where recurrent periods of hypoxemia are occurring. It's so over about five hours. Saturations go down as far as uh, 65, 70%. And when you apply CPAP of about 12 centimeters of water the next night, you treat this obstructive sleep apnea. Person feels refreshed. And so that's a effective therapy, and it can be durable in those that are able to tolerate it. It opens the airway. It passively opens it up. There's no muscle activation that occurs at 0, 5, 10, 15. Notice that the airway opens asymmetrically, not like a round hole. It, it's more uh, lateral than AP. And this is an example here on the right-hand slide uh, where you take CPAP and you drop it. The genioglossal EMG activity remains low until you have an arousal. And so it's not associated with increasing e, uh, uh, muscle activity. It's associated with, with uh, having the air pressure high enough so that it doesn't uh, uh, close. So the CPAP target is a small collapsible airway. The muscle response is not relevant, but the acceptance rate is approximately 50%. Now, 50% therapy for a very common disease is still worth a lot. And it's our longest and strongest suit. Many people are, are remain to be diagnosed with sleep apnea. It's improved in terms of its technology, so maybe it's a little bit better now. And certainly to the alternative of a tracheostomy, it's, it is preferable. People turn to oral appliances, though, as an alternative in the late 80s. And now it's uh, there are many different devices, and there are Randomized controlled trials that show effectiveness in tongue advancement, mandibular advancement, adjustable, fixed, customized, boil and bite. Its major function is to reduce the closing pressure. It does so by about four to 10 centimeters of water, which means that if you are at plus four, you'll go to zero, and that may not treat you, but if it goes uh, to minus Five, that is, it, uh, your peak crit falls down below that critical value if you treat your sleep apnea. It, too, is adjustable, and you can adjust it in the lab, although at home you use a fixed device. And as you move out the jaw, 2 millimeters, 4 millimeters, 6 millimeters, the hypoxemia that occurs over that hour of uh, 
four hours of sleep is improved. Each two millimeters improved AHI by about 20%. In the obese, it's less effective than in the non-obese patient. And the outcome is not well predicted by AHI, but generally it's reserved for people with mild and moderate sleep apnea. It too opens the, the, the pharynx, both in the back of the tongue, as well as in the nasopharynx. Now we turn to surgical therapy. Surgical therapy tries to decrease peak crit as well. So CPAP on your left pressurizes the snout. Uh, peak crit uh, on your right goes down because you try to make the airway more stable. So there are many, many procedures that are tried. There's only one randomized controlled trial that I'll talk about, which shows the UPP, uvula palatal pharyngeoplasty, that is circumferential resection at the level of the soft palate, uh, can improve uh, AHI and have long-term benefit in some people. There are many surgical approaches. The most common is this uvo palatal pharyngeoplasty. It has about 18 modifications, and it's now been replaced by lateral wall stabilization. And there are now six versions of that. But if you go to your ear, nose, and throat uh, surgeon, uh, they have been trained in many different procedures that they say reduces snoring and sleepiness, including tracheostomy. But there are no PCRIT measures that have been done before and after those procedures on the upper airway, like uvula palatal pharyngeoplasty or lateral wall stabilization or nasal surgery. It's not as predictable, as durable, or generalizable as one would want, so it's usually not a first line approach. And there's no PCRIT measures. So I think the predictability and durability of, of surgical approaches does not put it into a category that would be more primary therapy like CPAP or like, uh, like a, 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 an oral appliance. There is one randomized control trial, and the CPAP is sort of shown in the upper left. You take out the soft palate, you take out the lateral wall, you cut on it, you work on it. But fortunately, it's not done as much as it used to be, mainly because after about two years, its durability starts to fade. Presumably, the airway then goes back to where it is. But in a three to six month period of time, if you do an intervention group with a surgical group and then a passive control, you can see that, uh, that uh, uvo palatal pharyngeoplasty results in a pretty substantial fall in AHI from a mean somewhere around uh, 50 to one that's down somewhere around 20. And, but some go then even below 10 or below 5, which is thought to be a cure. And the control, uh, there are people, though, that respond to uvo palatal pharyngeoplasty uh, where sleep apnea gets worse. And this is a multi-center trial, and there are probably differences among surgeons on this. The passive control on the right shows that there are some people that just get better. Now, maybe they get better because they are told they have sleep apnea. They are told that they are in a passive control, but that maybe if weight loss or maybe if alcohol withdrawal or abstinence uh, helps them, that their apnea, hypopnea index gets better.
Mandibular maxillary advancement is a hard tissue surgery. It makes the mandibular, mandible and the maxilla, that is above your upper teeth to your teeth and your mandible, to move forward. Success rates are fairly high with very selected patients. And the best uh, outcomes are people that have bird-like faces that have very narrow jaw that are moved out. So the imaging describes size increases at the level of tongue, but all showed nasal pharyngeal increases as well. There were no measures of PCRIT in outcome studies. So presumably the PCRIT improves. More predictable and perhaps generalizable in part because of the recent use of pre-surgical planning tools. So the surgeons that do this uh, use a almost plastic surgery-like approach to sort of predict what will happen. And they do so because it also changes the profile of the face. So thingies, this is a group of things that really kind of do all sorts of various things, but they all do, they have different targets, but they all lower PCRIT. The WINKS, which I don't think is any, uh, no longer available, it was a suction device that kind of pulled the tongue forward. And it really never got into favor, but it uh, did uh, decrease PCRIT. It did open the airway. The PROVENT, which uh, no longer is available as of August 1st, 2020, were little valves that you put into the nose and you could breathe in easily. But as you breathed out, there was a positive pressure and expiration. And so it sort of worked against the P crit that is occurring over the respiratory cycle and in particular during expiration. And the Symmetrics device called CNAP or negative pressure around the neck has been shown in pilot, uh, a pilot publication that is uh, available through, uh, through the internet, uh, is now being set into play for a phase three FDA trial. And it has negative pressure around the neck. And in a small group of about 20 people, it had pretty good success. And the engineering needed to get better, the fit needs to get better, but it, not, it's, but like positive pressure on the inside of the airway, negative pressure outside the airway is a potential way to treat this particular disease. Obesity loads the system. It's a mechanical load, and it makes the PCRIT get more positive. Weight loss for OSA improves uh, sleep apnea. About 10% weight loss results in a significant 20% improvement in, in, in apnea apopnea index. The bariatric surgery results in 75 to 88% cure rate, not 100% at one year. The PCRIT is reduced, and medical and bariatric weight loss uh, is about the same. So if you can achieve weight loss, however, however surgery or however medically you can do it, uh, sleep apnea improves. And as you can sort of guess as to how much it might improve with how much weight you uh, should lose. Uh, and you can then find and guess and check once you lose the weight as to whether or not the sleep apnea is in a position where it no longer might be harmful to you. That is below about an AHI of 10. So obesity loads the system, and obesity changes the critical closing pressure, making it more positive and making it easier for the airway to close. So obesity is a target because it could change critical closing pressure.
Weight loss for OSA is effective, about modest 10% weight loss results in a significant about 20% improvement in the apnea hypopnea index. The bariatric surgery results in about 75 to 88% cure rate for OSA, not 100%, and this is at one year. And PCRIT is reduced in both medical and bariatric weight loss. PCRIT is the major anatomy, but other features uh, are improved. Loop gain appears to be improved because the lungs are bigger. And there may even be an effect on muscle response and that it's easier to activate your muscles and have them effective in your upper airway. Weight loss also improves sleep-wake mechanisms and reduces arousals during sleep. Neuromuscular therapy. So now we're going to turn to uh, this example here where the genioglossal EMG drops out, esophageal pressure continues, and these mechanical loads there produce this obstructive apnea. So is there a way to get this EMG activity, which drops out during obstructive apnea, back on track? Compensatory neuromuscular responses could do this, but the other way to do it would be neurostimulation. And that's the Inspire device is currently FDA approved. There are two or three other neurostimulatory uh, therapies. This stimulator is placed on the hypoglossal nerve, it has a generator in the chest, and uh, puts a stimulus into the nerve. And its first proof of principle was demonstrated in 1993. It was approved for the FDA in 2014. Upper airway stimulation immediately stabilizes the airway. On the left is before, and on the right is a continuing trace of after turning on the stimulator. And you can see the stimulator trace in the EMG channel as the, the, the third, fourth channel down. And on the left, there's one, two, three, four obstructive apneas where there's no airflow at the nose or mouth, chest wall movement and oxygen saturation falls. And after you turn on the device at the arousal uh, from the last obstructive apnea, there's a little wobble, but then it goes on very nicely and prevents these obstructive apneas. It leaves all the other pathways ideally alone, although we now know that there is also involvement in selection in loop gain, and there also is involvement in, uh, in this particular therapy of, uh, of sleep-wake cycles. It does not produce arousals however. The INSPIRE effect is during drug-induced sedation. And I want you to look at the lower left and at the movement of the tongue base. And you can see during when the therapy is off that it's pretty closed. And looking to the right, the therapy is on. It opens the tongue base. And it would be pretty stupid if the hypoglossal nerve, which is the major producer, uh, protruser muscle of the tongue, if stimulating that didn't open the back, of the, the back of the tongue. But on the upper left, it's the palate with the therapy off. And on the upper right is the palate uh, with the therapy on. And you see it also opens up the area behind the uh, soft palate and in the nasopharynx. 
So that this is a therapy that not only opens the oral pharynx, but the nasal pharynx and works because of that principle of pulling the airway forward. So the druggable pathway are the last things to discuss. So drugs would be a paradigm shift for the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. We don't think that drugs are going to change the anatomy. We think that drugs could hit loop gain, poor muscle response, and sleep-wake mechanisms. And there are some e examples of how this could happen. These are mostly physiologic studies of 10, 12 people at a time in which they demonstrate the effect of something, and then look at its effect on AHI. Oxygen, acetazolamide, and buspirone change loop gain and are used in the treatment of non-obstructive apneas. Sleep-wake mechanisms are targeted to reduce the arousal thresholds using both uh, trazodone and benzodiazepines. And uh, there is uh, some interest in trying to find out what patients would respond to this, particularly if they're on a therapy like CPAP or on an oral appliance. And then there, are what I'd like to talk about a little more here is this development of, of drugs that might um, affect the muscles of the upper airway. Muscle training is another alternative. Um, we're thinking about that and drugs itself. These dramadol, dizipramine, adovedbine, and oxybutrin. These are drugs that were understood as potentially important by looking at the rodent's 12th nerve, that is the hypoglossal no motor nucleus, looking at its gene expression of receptors and doing studies that showed that there are different effects of different activation or inactivation of these receptors that produce either more apneas or inhibit apneas during sleep. Cannabinoid receptors and dramadol reverses central apneas and has been used in obstructive apneas to reduce them. There are publications on this. Dramadol is FDA approved for the treatment of cancer pain but don't run out and treat your sleep apnea with it right yet because it's not terribly, uh, 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 doesn't make a terribly big effect on the AHI, but it does make a consistent effect. And it's a hint that you can actually change AHI with a drug. The one that has the most experience and most mechanistic understanding is that muscarinic tone in REM is, depresses genioglossal EMG activity. And so muscarinic tone, if you could prevent it or augment it during not a REM sleep, you might uh, improve an obstructive apnea. And androgenic tone with, withdrawal in non-REM sleep depresses genioglossal EMG activity. So if you could augment adrenergic uh, uh, tone, you might treat uh, obstructive apneas in non-REM sleep. This is a really a breakthrough idea that you would treat it using two drugs targeting different, uh, different uh, stages of sleep. You activate the genioglossus with, and in this particular study with, with antomoxetine, which increases adrenergic tone in non-REM sleep. It's a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor currently used for ADHD, and it's off-label in 2017. And oxybutrin decreases muscarinic tone in REM sleep, and it's an anticholinergic medication used in urinary and bladder difficulties and decreasing muscle spasm.
this is an interesting demonstration. Placebo, both together and each alone. What you can see is that from about an average of 35 to 40, the both together change the apnea hypopnea index to between, oh, say, 5 and 15. But each alone had very little effect. Genioglossal measures were made uh, to look for enhanced responsiveness. On the left is a sort of a graph showing placebo activation during an obstructive apnea had this sort of a, of a, of a, a recruitment of the genioglossus, and on both drugs it was much higher. So the pathways to recurrent obstructive apnea is greater than 15. What are the treatment goals? Anatomy is a CPAP, oral appliance, Provent, Winks, CNEP, Nastent, weight loss, surgery. The goal is to change the anatomy and make it less collapsible. Loop gain, people have combined uh, oxygen in some sleep apnea uh, patients with CPAP or oxygen alone to improve obstructive apneas because it depresses loop gain and depresses the chance of having another apnea. Cetazolamide and buspirone have been tried with single-dose studies. Trazodone and aziplicone for a benzodiazepine can also reduce apneas modestly. And in terms of these newer things for muscle tone responses, upper airway stimulation, muscle training, and drugs. So I want a summary, I want to talk about uh, uh, this causal pathways for the treatment of sleep apnea. So that obstructive sleep apnea is a state-related disorder. You need sleep caused by an abnormal anatomy, a bad peak crit, a reduced muscle activation, and to make a lot of apneas, you need a high gain or sensitivity. So that once you break from one apnea, you're more likely to go into another. And the current therapy targets are generally towards the anatomy, CPAP, oral appliance, anatomic surgery, or muscle activation, hypoglossal nerve stimulation. And aspirational would be drug therapy. So the anatomy and muscle activation by hypoglossal nerve stimulation are FDA approved. I want to thank you for your attention and uh, we'll look forward to discussing this with you. Thank you. And this afternoon, we have Dr. Kingman Stroll with us for a live Q&A session. Dr. Stroll, thank you so much for your lecture and then joining us for the live event this afternoon. Well, thank you. It's my honor. Excellent. During your lecture, we composed a, a list of questions that have come up as you spoke, and if you're ready, we'll dig in. Sure, sounds good. Excellent. First question comes, says, can a PSG study be done while a patient has an Inspire device? Sure. Uh, polysomnogram is done to assess uh, its, uh, its efficacy, and you can also adjust therapy on the, uh, in the PSG uh, room. There's a, uh, a, a sort of a tablet with a uh, activator that's placed over the chest and the person is in the next room playing a video game with your uh, with your tongue being able to see if increasing the uh, the uh, 
voltage or changing the frequency makes a difference in how your airway stays open during sleep. Very interesting. Thank you. Our next question. You stated the Provent is no longer available. Is it no longer being manufactured and why? Well, the, uh, I, I think it's primarily a sales uh, issue is that it did not get a lot of traction in sales. So they no longer made it available as of uh, August 1st, uh, 2020. There is a new product called Bongo out there that I have not seen yet, which has the same principles and has valves that are expiratory valves. And those uh, I hope to see fairly soon. Uh, but the principle is, again, this back pressure that keeps the airway open at the start of inspiration and prevents uh, closure uh, and, and prevents snoring. I've, I've not uh, used it, uh, but the principle is the same or similar to the, uh, to the ProVent device. Excellent. Thank you for that. Our next question is, will UAS be more streamlined first-line surgical approach to OSA? Well, I think right now it's pretty, pretty clunky. Uh, it requires uh, surgery uh, and compared to our other therapies, it's, uh, it, it's a little fussy. I mean, people may, may not like putting on a mask at night and taking it off in the morning, but you have to turn this thing on at night and turn it off in the morning. Um, it is implantable. There, uh, it, it, it's a technology that the components of which come from probably the late 1990s. And so everyone can think of new things to do and new things to, to put in, make it smaller, make it laparoscopically put into your tongue. And, and maybe those sorts of uh, smaller, better, faster, cheaper uh, approaches uh, can find the marketplace. Thank you. Our next question is, what are your thoughts about using Lunesta short-term for patients when first starting CPAP therapy? Well, Lunesta is, a, it, it, or any particular sleeping medication has been shown in uh, double blind studies to improve CPAP adherence for the first two weeks of therapy. Uh, it, there's not a lot of experience with it. Uh, and, and I sometimes do that. We actually have a, a trial to try to do a non-controlled substance uh, with that trazodone in the same way. And it, uh, it, it, it is something that uh, is worth thinking about, but, but who would benefit? Because you, there are downside risks to, to benzodiazepines or all these medications with side effects or parasomnias or getting up in the middle of the night. So it may increase confusion and arousals as well. Uh, the, the major thing in CPAP is to, is to talk the patient off the cliff as to this is a terrible thing. You have to say, well, you wear it during sleep. You have to be comfortable. You should wear it during the day. It's not something that you put on for the first time 10 minutes before you want to go to sleep. But those first two weeks of therapy are very important. Agreed. Thank you very much. Our next question, will other pharmacological approaches have a new place in treating OSA and lowering the PCRIT? Well, I think the... Uh, the breakthrough was to be able to have a drug that uh, that understood, or at least two drugs that understood how you reduced your upper airway drive during sleep. Now we're quite interested uh, in this process because probably having your airway closed during sleep is not evolutionarily the right thing to do. So there is probably a mechanism that keeps your airway open uh, and a healthy airway has that. And it's not just anatomy, it's also control. And so to be able to have more basic science to unlock that mechanism. So keeping an airway open during sleep would be just as, as, as coordinated as hiccups or just as coordinated as a sneeze in terms of using your upper airway or alternatively swallowing. So we're very interested in those posterior nasopharyngeal channel, those muscles, and, and working from the neural system out rather than from the muscle system in. But if you say, well, what drug would be there? I, I think we're, 
we're, we're, it's been 20 years of basic science to get to this point. And, and um, there have been some examples, but uh, we, we need to be able to, to study these drugs in the context of knowing the mechanism for the individual patient. Thank you very so much. For instance, so for instance, using a drug in which your P crit is very high probably won't help. Thank you. Our next question, what is most effective treatments for patients with high loop gain? Well, high loop gain, I, uh, it, it is, uh, the most common example is that of chain stokes respiration in which there is no uh, uh, obstructive apneas, and these are all non-obstructive apneas. And since, since all apneas occur with a reduction in drive, I'll just use that as an example. And you can reduce loop gain with oxygen. You can reduce gain by increasing oxygen stores with CPAP, even with, with chain stokes respiration. Uh, and then the medications are useful. We have a, an easy way to measure loop gain in our usual PSGs. That approach and that understanding of how to do that has not yet been, a, been made a, a commodity. That is, it's usually made in very specialized laboratories that, that are able to measure this. But as soon as we get a sense of that uh, idea of loop gain and we have, a, a, and we can identify those individuals, we can then target those for medications that would reduce uh, the gain. Now, I don't like the term loop because everybody kind of doesn't know what that means. It's just the gain of the system. It's just how steep it is and, and how, how low it is. Now, really low gain, you would hypoventilate and you wouldn't breathe at all. So there is a, a happy medium there that we need to achieve. Excellent. Next question, we have just a couple more. Thank you for being so um, open to answering our questions today. It's fun. Do you think that other devices will replace CPAP therapy in the upcoming years? Well, CPAP, we have a long history with. And uh, if people remember what the CPAP devices were in the 80s, 90s, and early part of this century, you'll realize the new machines, the new CPAP uh, tubing, the, the profile of it on your face and on your head have improved significantly. Um, I think it's going to be a first line event. I mean, it's pretty easy. You put it on, you take it off. And uh, guess what? You, you know, if it takes you five minutes to fall asleep and three minutes to wake up and, and take it off, you just wore it for eight minutes because you were asleep the rest of the time. So, you know, I, th I think that the way of approaching that is going to be very important. Certainly there are those that really can't or won't wear CPAP. And uh, we need to have those alternatives. But this is not a zero sum game. It's not as though we have 10 people in the world that have CPAP uh, or that, that have OSA. It, it's, we're increasing uh, numbers and it's a fairly cost effective therapy when you think about it. Absolutely. Okay, next question. What is the least favored surgical approach based on outcomes? Well, uh, it, it, there are so many surgical approaches, uh, and there are fairly few studies of, of, uh, of outcome. The one that I mentioned, which was the mandibular maxillary advancement, uh, claims 90% cure rates. But those are very selected uh, people with a tremendously difficult uh, uh, surgery that requires a lot of uh, planning and movement and rehabilitation. Now, uh, the, the little ones that people play uh, don't have, on the contrary, don't have a lot of success, but are often touted. Uh, for instance, uh, nasal surgery is thought to be important, but there are no studies that show it's very successful. And then things like uh, uh, lateral wall stabilization, uveal palatal pharyngeoplasty, and other plastic procedures are useful, but the durability of those is, is not as, 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 as good as you would want. I mean, two years from now, you would like to have a durable effect. And that may be because the same forces that produced your obstructive apneas are still working on you. So they produced it when you were age 45, you had surgery, and those same forces are going to produce it to have you have more sleep apnea when you're 55. 
So I, I, the surgery question is there. It's not that I'm against surgery. I think that that there are people that are, are looking at uh, what would be called little ball. That is a surgery here and a surgery there, knocking down sleep apnea by 50% until you get into a range where it's it's no longer uh, no longer a problem. But uh, but there are other approaches. We're really very intrigued by this muscle therapy, by myofunctional therapy, and we think that that uh, uh, that may not be the answer. But it's certainly trying to figure out those mechanisms will tell us more about those muscles that anatomy and perhaps the success and failure of surgery as well. Well, Dr. Stroll, that comes to the end of our session today. On behalf of Medical Service Company, thank you for joining us with the live Q&A session um, and then as well, also with your lecture. Thank you very much for joining us. All right. Us. Well, have a good day. Sleep well and have a better tomorrow. Thank you. You as well. <laughs>